Well, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to another in our uh, series of uh, lectures uh, put on by our center, the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Core Texts and Ideas. Uh, our center is running the new Great Books undergraduate program at the University of Texas. And on the table up here, we have uh, several brochures that will tell you more about the program uh, and the certificate in uh, uh, courses that we grant to students who uh, finish the program. It's, uh, it's a kind of a minor, if you will. So I uh, uh, urge you uh, to take a look at those brochures and take one with you. And, uh, uh, be, feel free to ask me any questions afterwards about the program. One of the things we do is a uh, undergraduate book club that meets uh, once or twice every month to uh, screen a classic movie and then discuss it afterwards or attend a play or a, another uh, per kind of performance or sometimes to read a short text and we welcome anyone to join that book club and you'll see things about that and who to contact. We also have a website that uh, contains all our information as well. And, uh, we, of course, carry on this lecture series, and uh, today I'm uh, very uh, pleased and uh, proud to introduce Professor Wayne Ambler, who's the director of the Humanities Program, the Herbst Humanities Program at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Before that, for many years, he taught at the University of Dallas and was uh, in charge of the University of Dallas's Rome uh, Liberal Arts Program in Rome, Italy. He uh, made his mark as a scholar with uh, a series of uh, extraordinarily penetrating and helpful studies of Aristotle's politics. Uh, then he has made uh, major translations from the Greek of uh, the principal political works of Xenophon. And most recently, he has been working on translations and studies of Aristophanes. And he's going to grace us today with reflections on Aristophanes' critique of the gods. Professor Ambler. Thank you very much, and, and that was uh, very generous uh, uh, as an introduction, and I, of course, as a graduate student, was taught to love the truth, but having heard these nice words, I'm inclined to think that flattery may be even better. <laughs> this, is, this is terrific. Um, I, I'd like to thank the uh, professors uh, Pangle for uh, inviting me to speak today, and thank the Jefferson uh, Center for hosting me here. I've been here for several days hanging out. I've met a number of undergraduates, graduate students, faculty members, and uh, I'm tremendously impressed by the opportunity represented here by the Jefferson Center. It seems to me there's a very, very high density of extraordinarily good conversations, uh, a wonderful mix of top-notch thinkers, scholars, and of, of eager students and good teachers. So I, I really am impressed. I can't think of a place that I'd rather be uh, either as a young student or as an established teacher. And since uh, Aristophanes' comic he heroes are very much on my mind these days, uh, and the things that they do are extraordinary. I mean, I'm thinking of Tregaeus flying up to heaven on the back of a dung beetle to bring back the goddess Peace, or, or think of uh, you know, Dionysius going down into Hades uh, in order to bring back a good poet, and he comes back with Aeschylus for Athens. This is absolutely wonderful, and I think if I really learned anything from Aristophanes, I, I think this, I, I should be able to figure out a way to bring the Jefferson Center back to Boulder in my carry-on <laughs> luggage. <laughs> but uh, so far, I'm a little bit perplexed by this, but uh, anyway, it, it's terrific to be here. Um, and if I fail to uh, transport you all to lovely Boulder, Colorado in my carry-on, uh, I hope at least in some partial compensation for this great opportunity, uh, that I'm able to stimulate a little bit of uh, thought about Aristophanes in my remarks this afternoon. I need to thank also my home university, which uh, supported my visit. They thought that if they sent me down here for several days, I would come back a better teacher and a better scholar. And I was delighted that they uh, had this opinion, of course. I helped uh, to persuade them of this. Um, and to tell you the truth, I, th I think it's likely to be true. Uh, but I say this also as an encouragement to you to raise uh, your questions at the end of my remarks and, and don't hold back. After all, in Aristophanes, the shortest route by which you can improve somebody is to boil them like a sausage. So have, have a go at it at the end. And if you if think you can uh, keep up your boiling long distance, uh, my e email address is easily found. Go ahead, I'd be happy to write back to you uh, if you have some further thoughts uh, that you'd like to share. 
I'd like to begin today with Socrates in the Clouds, and I do so in part because this is the play that I think most of you are most likely to be familiar with. And this also allows me to begin very close to home with the Thomas Jefferson Center. Uh, listen to the very beautiful motto of the Center. Fix reason firmly in her seat and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. The Center recognizes the risk that in calling every opinion before the tribunal um, that true reason may not appear spontaneously. And so in the statement, in the brochure from which I'm, that I'm consulting, it goes on to call for the study in core texts which disagree with one another, making it difficult to come to a premature conclusion. It also calls for the participation of scholars from different departments and also from different schools of thought. It calls for critical self-scrutiny. And it also invites into the conversation critics of reason as well as defenders, not only today, but on multiple occasions, precisely because they offer a rich but different assessment of the relationship between reason and society than Jefferson himself did. These seem to me to be thoughtful measures to reduce the risk that pseudo-reason will steal the seat reserved for reason herself. The Socrates of the Clouds, on the other hand, offers us a case study in reason run amok. He appears devoted to the life of careful examination, but notwithstanding this devotion, or perhaps because of the way he goes about it, he gets a great deal wrong. His core, mistake, his core mistakes concern Zeus and the gods. Now Socrates flatly and loudly denied the existence of, of Zeus in the beginning of the clouds, and he did this to his fellow countrymen, the, the country bumpkin Strepsiades. And for a while, uh, Strepsiades suffered no great harm um, as a consequence of this, blurt, this, this blunt ass, uh, assertion that Zeus did not exist. Strepsiades thought, well, um, I'm going to be liberated from my debts by this teaching that I'm going to receive from the think tank here at Socrates' hands. If I need to be liberated from Zeus at the same time, small price to pay. The key thing is to escape those debts. But of course, as you know, uh, he ends up sending his son Pheidippides to study with Socrates, and Pheidippides proves to be a very probing student. And in a relatively short period of time, he comes back uh, to his father, and he has learned to love Euripides instead of Aeschylus. Uh, he is excited about a play that treats the subject of incest. This seems no problem for him. He finds one of his greatest pleasures is now to hold the the established laws in contempt to look down upon them. And of course, uh, most importantly, he defends as just the beating of his father, using violence against his father, and goes on to add uh, that he's prepared to defend the beating of his mother as well. And not just to, def to defend it, to actually do it. Um, so this turns out uh, to suggest that this uh, Socratic science, if I can call it that, or pseudoscience, is, is indeed far more radical than Strepsides uh, understood at the outset. And to punctuate this point, almost the last words of the play are chase them, strike them, where them refers to Socrates and his students. Do this for many reasons, but especially because they were knowingly unjust to the gods. It even seems to be the case that Hermes, the god, appears on stage to support the violent actions taken against the godless Socrates. Now, whereas Socrates became famous for saying that the unexamined life is not worth living, the clouds seems to say, perhaps. But at a minimum, the value of an examined life depends upon the examiner, and it presents many opportunities for poor examiners to go astray. This ending of the clouds fits with Aristophanes' reputation, in the eyes of many, as being generally conservative. Aristophanes also, for example, appears in other plays to oppose demagoguery and the radicalization of the Athenian democracy, to, to oppose paying the poor to serve on juries, which might feed this radicalization, to oppose the war with Sparta, and to oppose other purveyors of new ideas, such as the Sophists and Euripides, along with Socrates, and to oppose the urban center, as opposed to outlying farms. 
conservative defenders of the Olympian gods must have been pleased to see their attacker so decisively rebuffed at the end of the clouds. But this is not the only play in which the gods are of central importance to the plot. If it were, my title would be wholly wrong. I should speak instead about Aristophanes' criticisms of the critics or the deniers of the gods. But there are other plays to consider, ones in which Aristophanes appears to be less orthodox than the end of the clouds suggests. Taking them into account makes it possible to compare Aristophanes' criticisms of Zeus and the Olympians with Socrates' blunt denials of their existence. There are 11 plays of Aristophanes that survive, and of these 11 plays, there are six, depending on how you count them exactly, that actually include gods on stage. There are two minor appearances by deities, one in the Knights, a character named Amphitheus, and one the Hermes in the clouds that I just mentioned. Some scholars will deny that Hermes is actually on stage and say, in fact, it's rather uh, a statue. And in addition to these two relatively minor cases are, are four major cases, and they are the frogs, the peace, uh, the birds, and the wealth. And in these case, in these four plays, the gods are prominent, important figures of the plot. Um, and of these four, it turns out that three of them have a mortal being that uh, is critical of Zeus. So we have, a, we have a mortal on stage who finds fault with Zeus in three of these plays. It's the four that I just mentioned, minus the frog. So the peace, the birds, and the wealth. And this mortal figure is, is upset with the, the Olympian gods generally, and Zeus in particular, and offers, I would say, um, more or less articulate criticism of what's wrong with the gods. This mortal character not only um, is critical, but actually acts vigorously in support of or in behalf of his criticism, so it's not just talk. And the amazing thing in these three plays um, that I have on my, my list for the day, uh, the mortal actually succeeds in either circumventing the king of the gods so that he becomes, so Zeus becomes of negligible importance, or alternatively taking him on frontally, launching an attack directly against Zeus and the Olympians and succeeding. So the conservative Aristophanes, who is so critical of, of Aristophanes in these plays, actually uh, allows, a, I'll call him a hero, a hero to be on stage at the end of the play, celebrates this individual, um, and someone who, this hero who has in fact challenged Zeus and won. Now the most wonderful case uh, of, of the three, I think, and uh, I mentioned this to try to strengthen my point about the, the radicalism of Aristophanes' plays, is the case of a character named Pesatyrus in The Birds. And I'm not assuming that all of you will have read The Birds recently, um, but I think it's easy to say there's, that it's a wonderful play of the wonderful main plot. This character, Pesatyrus, abandons his homeland, Athens. He leaves Athens. And uh, through a complex chain of events, he decides, in fact, that he is going to lead an attack on Zeus. He recruits allies for this attack on Zeus. They're birds. This is Aristophanes, after all. So he unites the birds uh, to go and attack Zeus. He becomes the tyrannos, or the tyrant, or the supreme leader over his allies, um, even though he had, in fact, led them to believe that they would become supreme in the end. And near the end of the play, so great is his power over the birds, and so different are his interests from those of the birds, that there's a wonderful scene in which he's sitting down grilling a number of the birds on his abachi and dining on them with some enthusiasm. So here the supreme leader takes his allies, uh, leads them against the Olympians, overthrows the Olympians, eats his allies, and uh, takes Zeus's own right-hand girl, the beautiful Basileia, who holds all of Zeus's powers, lightning bolts and everything else, marries her at the end, and the last words of the play have Pesatyrus. Um, referred to as the highest of the divinities. So he becomes, in fact, the chief god. Now, Pesatyrus is an outrageous character because of this impious plan of his and because of the way he treats his very own allies. But more outrageous than Pesatyrus, I would like to suggest, is Aristophanes. <laughs> because Aristophanes 
could have turned Pesatiris into a, a grim or ridiculous reminder to other would-be tyrants that, um, you know, that this is what happens when somebody tries to take on the, on the gods, and this is what happens when somebody tries to become a tyrant. And then this, this defeated character would be a warning um, to potential tyrants in Athens. It would be consistent with a celebration of the virtues of Marathon, for example. But instead, Aristophanes has Pesatiris at the end of the play, um, as on center stage, being treated as a complete success, no obvious moral problems with what he's done. He enjoys an apotheosis, a beautiful wedding. People are singing his praises. So the same author who ended the clouds by burning down the school of a teacher, whose radical thoughts on justice and Zeus wreaked havoc but with, what, with but one Athenian family, this same author now allows the hero of the birds not only to criticize Zeus, but to defy him and even replace him. An explanation is in order. Now, The Birds is the most radical of the three Zeus plays, as I'll call them, the three plays when there's a mortal who challenges Zeus. Um, but I do want to mention the other two as well, um, as perhaps suggesting a, a broad pattern. Um, and I'll, I, I would like to just mention a, a quick kind of overview, not of the plays as a whole, but of key points that useful for, for what I, I'll have to say. The piece um, is a play in which has a lead character named Trigaius, and Trigaius is suffering along with his fellow Athenians and non-Athenians because of the long, long war between Athens on the one hand and Sparta on the other. And as you may know, this war would go on you know, to last 26, 27 years uh, before it finally comes to a halt, and obviously major sufferings uh, for those who lived during this time. Trigaius thinks something like this, what is Zeus doing to help this problem? He must know we're suffering. Where is the king of the gods when we need him? Um, and so he contrives a plan to go up to heaven to let Zeus know the hardships of the Greeks. Now it turns out it's very dangerous to get to heaven. <laughs> and Tr Trigaius, on his first attempt, for example, climbs a ladder and the ladder falls down. But he's determined because he sees this as the best hope for bringing the peace that the Greeks need so desperately. And then he conceives the plan, I know, I'll fly to heaven on the back of a dung beetle. So he finds uh, this massive dung beetle that is, uh, a vorace, has a voracious appetite uh, for, for dung and is also a very discerning connoisseur of the dung that this beetle eats. Uh, and Trigaius mounts this dung beetle and flies toward heaven. And this is, as I say, very, very dangerous. I'm trying to bring out the courage of our hero because if even a single outhouse door is left slightly ajar, this beetle will veer sharply <laughs> toward earth, probably throw its rider into the Aegean, and that will be the end. So it takes a certain um, courage and conviction that his cause is worth the risks that are entailed in this. Having achieved this great success, one might think that Trigaius' job is done because he does indeed arrive in heaven. But surprise, when he gets to heaven, in fact, it turns out that Zeus and the other Olympian gods have vacated the premises. They've, re they've retreated deeper under the dome of heaven. So his great success, in the short run at least, comes to naught. Uh, he makes some inquiries. Um, and he learns that Zeus and the Olympian gods have decided to leave their usual locale, their usual home, because they got sick and tired of the Greeks always asking for things down below. So if before he thought, well, maybe the problem is Zeus doesn't know what is happening, so I don't need to blame Zeus's goodness or love of man, I'll just think, well, maybe he doesn't know enough. And then I'll go up and tell him what the problem is, now he learns that Zeus has in fact vacated the, present, the premises with full knowledge of the difficulties, or at least with some knowledge of the difficulties. I hesitate to say Zeus ever has full knowledge of anything, but with some knowledge of the difficulties, Zeus has left, has left the premises. Um, and this, of course, calls Zeus's goodness into question. Why would a god who loves human beings, suffering down below in war, knowing, knowingly leave them the way Zeus does? This seems to me to help Trigaius decide not to submit to this. Oh, okay, Zeus has decided this is the best thing to do. 
Then, with patient forbearance, I will respect the rule of Zeus and go back home and suffer with the rest of the Greeks. To the contrary, uh, he decides now to turn against the king of the gods. He must know that peace is deeply good, um, and he um, unhesitatingly leads a group of, um, a, of Greeks to try to excavate the goddess peace. And this is necessary because Zeus not only left the premises, this is another little charming deed by the king of the god, he, he left war in charge. So he's going to leave the premises and says, okay, war, you take over. And war is, of course, represented on stage, as you might imagine, a comic character of war. He's not a pleasant character. So his first act, he's got a free hand. He can do what he wants. What's the first thing to do? I know. I'll bury peace in a deep hole and pile rocks on top of her. So war has actually done this. Trigaius, therefore, has got to recruit Greeks uh, to excavate uh, peace from the ground. And he does this successfully. He unites the Greeks, pulls peace out of the ground. The Olympian gods are not overthrown. He takes her back down to earth. The Olympian gods are not um, directly overthrown, but they are defied because Zeus had said there would be a penalty of death for anyone who tried to dig peace out of the ground. Um, but interestingly, human beings, now that they have peace, a goddess down below on Earth, they redirect the sacrifices that they used to offer up to Zeus and the Olympian gods. Who do they want to sacrifice to now? They sacrifice to peace instead. And peace gets to be called the greatest of the goddesses, and she gets to be called the most philanthropic or human-loving divinity, while Zeus, War, and the other Olympian gods fade into insignificance. In addition to peace, prayers are offered to the graces, to the seasons, to Aphrodite, the goddess of love, to yearning. Um, and Ares, the god of war, is explicitly forbidden as a possible object of sacrifice. So what has happened then as a consequence of this, you could say, is that the pantheon has shifted a bit away from Zeus and the Olympians in favor of the goddess peace. So when human beings are gripped by the importance of peace, it appears, it appears to me that is, uh, that gods of a more militant disposition fade from the scene. And if human beings can secure peace by their own efforts, the need for Zeus dwindles. The play suggests the Olympians thrive only when human beings think they need them. And the pantheon is adjusted so as to establish the new goddess peace. Sacrifice is offered to the new goddess, not to the old gods, and the very nature of the sacrifice is altered. No longer do they sacrifice a big fat pig or a huge hecatomb of 100 oxen in a bloody slaughter. They choose a little lamb, a peaceful little lamb, and the sacrifice is off stage. As Trigaius um, triumphs here in this play, The Peace, triumphs over war and Zeus, in order to bring much longed for peace to the Greeks, so in the wealth the lead character, Kremlis, triumphs over poverty and Zeus in order to bring much longed for wealth to the Athenians. His actions have their origin in a comic version of Glaucon's wonderful question to Socrates at the beginning of Book Two of Plato's Republic. Um, you may remember this, Glaucon has this terrific question of, to, to Socrates of whether in fact it really makes sense uh, that one should sacrifice everything in order to preserve one's justice. Why should one do that when there's a tension between the two? And this is uh, the, the kind of version that, that, that Kremlis uh, would, would like to have answered. He, he's raising his son. It's not for his own sake, but he has a son. I want my son to be happy. What's likely to make my son happy? The life that I've lived? I'm God-fearing. I'm just, pretty much. I'm poor as can be, and I'm miserable. Maybe it would be better for my son if I taught him to be unjust. But he's hesitant to do this. So instead of going to Socrates to answer this, to, to get help with this question, he goes to the oracle at Delphi um, and wonders whether moral restraint really makes sense. Obedient to the oracle, he ends up learning the core problem with regard to wealth in our lives, that there's this disproportion between virtue or the desert, the deserving of wealth, and the possession of wealth. The people that have it ain't the people that deserve it. 
And Kremelis learns that the reason for this is that the god wealth is blind. God, the god wealth, would like to distribute his blessings to those who deserve them, but he can't see who they are. So there's a chaotic distribution of the material goods in the world. And um, Kremelis uh, also learns that the reason for this is that, the, is that Zeus is behind it. Zeus blinded, willfully blinded the god wealth out of envy for good people. As Trigaius uh, turned against Zeus in order to secure the blessings of peace, now Kremlis will uh, lose any attachment he might have had to Zeus in order to try to provide the blessings of wealth to his fellow Athenians and to himself. How to do this? Easy in Aristophanes. All you need to do is restore vision to the god wealth. Uh, and Kremlis sets out in order to restore his sight and hence bring back a measure of, of justice um, among human beings. Taken together, the two plays I've mentioned so far, The Peace and the Wealth, suggest, I think, that piety is in jeopardy if the gods cannot be defended as good or just. This is what helps the hero break away from devotion to Zeus, is this idea, I think, Zeus doesn't deserve my devotion. Put differently, our two rebellious heroes have at best a contingent devotion to Zeus. Their piety is not primary or fundamental. It is based on the premise that the gods are good, and this premise they are ready to put to the test. Kremlis, quite remarkably, again, this is Aristophanes, he succeeds and he restores the sight of the god wealth, and henceforth, wealth comes to be distributed justly. Uh, the great surprise in this case, I, I think it really is parallel to what happens in the piece, the great supply, surprise in this case is that the human beings, uh, now that they have this um, wealth that they've always wanted and they, they see that they're obtaining it through the God wealth, they direct their sacrifices, not to the God peace, that was the last play, Goddess Peace, they direct their sacrifices to the God wealth. And the traditional uh, gods of the Greeks, starting from Zeus and working through the Olympians, they become uh, forgotten. All prayer to these other gods ends. And Aristophanes, in, as only Aristophanes can do, punctuates this point so that you cannot mistake it. Uh, by reporting in the words of a, a, a priest of the temple of Zeus the Savior, who comes lamenting his fate, saying what? No longer do the Greeks bring sacrifices to Zeus the Savior anymore. They take them all to wealth. And so the temples have now become nothing but latrines. <laughs> so, so, so terrible is the oblivion into which the gods have sunk. I need to, to return very quickly uh, to the birds. I mentioned a little bit about it. But our first two plays are directed against Zeus because Zeus is a barrier to important goods, peace and wealth, um, according to these plays. And in the birds, it's not the case that there's a particular good that its hero, Pesatyrus, seeks. It's rather far broader and more fundamental an assault against Zeus and the gods. Its planned solution to the problem is far more general. It's not just to avoid uh, Zeus, but in fact to take him on directly. When he first conceives of his plan, Pesatyrus mentions prominently the word power. I see a plan with power. And it appears that the power he means is that power that his allies, the birds, might be able to enjoy if they were to follow his plan. If you, looking at the play as a whole, it seems more likely um, that he's thinking from this stage of his own power, because he certainly ends up to be the one who benefits uh, from the revolution that he uh, leads against the birds. Although uh, he, I think, is, see is seeking power, seeking to rule, that's certainly where he ends up. In the course of doing so, he, of course, has to articulate accusations against the Greek gods in order to win and shore up the support of his allies against them. Um, and so in, he makes a case that the Olympians are, in fact, very poor excuses for what gods ought to be. Uh, they're in the first place ineffectual. So Apollo is supposed to be the god of healing. He's supposed to heal, um, but in fact does not do this. And Demeter is supposed to provide grain and help with the fields. But in fact, uh, he suggests that if the birds would eat the seed, Demeter would not be able to undo this damage. And as the birds themselves um, add in this conversation, Zeus himself 
sits solemnly high in the clouds, too august to even lift a finger to help those on earth who have pressing needs. Worse, the inaction of the Olympian gods, that's the way they're presented, I'm claiming, that they look very ineffectual, very inactive. Their inaction does not keep them from expecting to be treated very well by human beings. They expect men to build beautiful temples with golden doors in their honor and to offer up abundant sacrifices to them. They are very high maintenance gods, and yet they do little in return. Even birds would be better, Pesatira suggests. At least birds eat caterpillars, and you can make birds happy with a few handfuls of bird seed. You don't need a hecatomb of well-fatted oxen to keep them fed. A little bush will please them even more than an elaborate temple with a carved pediment and massive marble columns. And birds are not going to seduce your wives and daughters. So Pesatiris <laughs> makes a, does a comparative study of birds in the Olympians and finds um, that the Olympians look quite bad uh, by comparison. So let me stress two points. Um, one is that um, Zeus is not only, I think, as portrayed in these plays, not very helpful to human beings. He also can't help himself. He's um, not an effective god, even where his own interests are concerned. He launches no effective countermeasures. He's under assault by Pesatiris, by Kremelis, by Trigaius, but he, he comes up with no effective countermeasures. No measures at all against Kremelis or Trigaius, as far as I can see. Um, and no effective ones against Pesatiris. Oh, it's true, in the case of Pesatiris, he sends P Iris down. What the heck is going on down there? Go take a look. <laughs> she flies down, Pesatiris goes, boo, to exaggerate slightly, she flies back up. It's not a, it's not a, you know, a, a really vigorous defense of his, of his authority. And then in the end, in one of the absolute you know, wonderful scenes, of many wonderful scenes in the play, he recognized that things are not going particularly well, so he does take some action. He sends three gods to go and negotiate with Pisatyrus so that he can try to save something of his, of his rule. But the three gods are, I mean, they make the three stooges seem extraordinarily competent by, by, uh, by comparison. They're divided against one another. Um, they, they can't represent his interests at, at all well. Zeus doesn't even seem to hear that there's a revolt taking place um, as peace is being excavated in heaven in the peace. Um, you'd think, and Pesatai, <laughs> I'm sorry, Trigaius in the peace is saying, okay, let's gonna, we're going to dig peace out of the ground. I want you to be very quiet because Zeus is up there and we don't want to disturb him. He, he could come down with a countermeasure. And the Greeks are so happy that they're going to have peace. They're dancing, <laughs> having the great time. They're singing. And Trigaius is saying, please be quiet. No matter how much noise they make, yanking her out of the ground, clanging away with their shovels, singing their songs, Zeus just doesn't get it. He doesn't hear a thing and he never shows up. Um, in short, he's an ineffectual god, is, is what I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting here. Okay, um, there are lots of little details that, that support this. Um, the list would be too long, but I, I am, I'm partial to this one last little detail, that the birds are several times celebrated as being of very keen vision. You know, they, they've flown all over, they've seen a lot, they've seen everything. When Prometheus decides to rebel against Zeus, he's worried about being seen by Zeus. So he opens a little parasol <laughs> and stands under it. This is sufficient. <laughs> this is sufficient. <laughs> That, uh, that Zeus can't see him. This would not be the case if the birds were gods. So a second point I'd like to, to stress at this stage of the game is, is that the good that men seek from the Olympians are relatively ordinary goods. No one of Aristophanes' characters looks to Zeus for the sake of eternal life or moral perfection. I should say no one that I've noticed, so if, if you notice one, let me know. They care about gods to help them enjoy peace, wealth, Health, longing, long life, love, cheerful continence of kindly tranquility, well-watered plowlands, sweet dried figs. These are the things that people want in, in Aristophanes' world. The most striking evidence in this connection is that the gods' wealth and peace are represented as satisfying fully the mortals' needs for the gods. Once they're around, 
the other gods are forgotten. Tension to them diminishes, even to the point of that terrible transformation of the temples that I mentioned. As far as I've noticed, Aristophanes does not use the gods or anything else uh, to minimize the rather ordinary pleasures that sweeten our lives. One of his three heroes does defend himself as just, but only as moderately just. And the solution he seeks is not Glaucon's, not a kind of justice with a capital J, whose purity and power are so great as to confer happiness even as one is being tortured on the rack watching terrible things happen to loved ones. To the contrary, this character, Kremlis, seeks to be just, but also to enjoy the blessings of prosperity, and he is richly rewarded. I take what is promised of or by the gods in Aristophanes as a guide to what is wanted from the gods. Aristophanes' revised pantheon looks more kindly on ordinary pleasures and does not offer great rewards for self-overcoming. I'd like to now mention a couple of exceptions to what I've uh, been suggesting. I, I think, obviously, that there are minor s exceptions, but I'd like to, the record to be full. Um, Apollo is celebrated um, for his connection with music. Um, music is beautiful. I think Aristophanes suggests that uh, in deed as well as in word, and Apollo is associated with that. Um, Hermes. Um, is at least capable of adroit selfishness. <laughs> In contrast to Zeus who, can't, Zeus, who can't help himself, Hermes is an operator. He's quick to uh, escape dangerous situations they may, that may require that he abandon his other fellow gods, but at least he's, he, he knows where his interests lie. And the muses and the graces um, are presented, I think, rather attractively in association with singing and dancing and the pleasures that go along with them. They're not um, subject to the kind of debunking uh, that Zeus gets. When it comes to effective action by gods, which constitute genuine exceptions to the pattern of divine incompetence, uh, the limit cases, I think, the most important ones occur in the wealth. Here in a single play, two gods do act effectively. Um, and this surprised me. <laughs> Um, Cario is the servant of the lead character in The Wealth, and the play opens with him, and he's complaining. And he's complaining about the oracle at Delphi under the auspices of the god Apollo. And he says, I can't believe it. I mean, Apollo has the reputation. He's supposed to be a healing god. And my master, who is crazy as a loon, went to the uh, oracle at Apollo, and what did Apollo do? He sent him away. He didn't cure him. So the opening of the play is a complaint against both the, his literal master and also Apollo for failing to cure the apparent madness of his master. So this would fit the pattern of divine incompetence if the accusation were true. But curiously, subsequent events seem to suggest um, that in fact Apollo is vindicated in this case because the master doesn't turn out so it appears to me, at least, to be mad. Um, so Apollo shouldn't be faulted for s setting him loose. And the second example from that play um, occurs when Kremlis wants to restore the sight of the god wealth. Uh, he would like to go to a doctor to have that sight restored, uh, but he can't find a doctor who will do it. So the second best when you can't find a doctor is to go to a god. And he goes to the god Asclepius then to try to find the healing that might restore the sight of the god. Amazingly, Asclepius succeeds. So these are two examples of divine competence. These two cases, both in wealth, may be just exceptions to prove the rule, maybe. That is, they help to set the standard by which Zeus and the other Olympians should be judged if the gods generally generally advised and healed, as well as these two gods did in these two cases, then by all means it would make sense to honor and reward them. Since they don't, it does not. Hence, nothing either of these two gods does sheds an attractive light on Zeus. A further note is in order, however. Both of these divine actions, so helpful to Kremlis, turn out to be harmful to the gods themselves. Apollo and Asclepius show oracular and medical competence that the effect of their competence is to enable a mortal to defy the king of the gods. That is, by their very competence, they actually enable Kremlis to restore the vision of the god wealth, 
that enables wealth to become the supreme deity over men, that requires that the other gods then lapse into desuetude in comparison to the god wealth. So the very success of these gods actually leads to the undoing of the, of the Olympian gods and to the, the triumph of the god wealth. It leads to their own undoing, it appears. So I'm not sure whether it's divine competence in the end or not. It's, it's retail competence, but it's a, it's a problem for them in the long run. Uh, okay, those are my, my chief exceptions. Uh, Prometheus is a, is a funny possibility also, but he only gets honorable mention, so I'll pass over him for the sake of time. Um, to sum up, I think in all of these plays you see a human being who attacks Zeus. You see a human being who succeeds in his attack on Zeus. You see threatening voices on behalf of Zeus. Hermes, poverty, and Iris, but you don't see any vigorous action by Zeus himself. Uh, you see empty threats of divine punishment. Um, and, well, they are empty threats. You see threats, and they always prove empty. In general, I think there's a suggestion here that human obligations to the gods depend upon the gods' conduct toward human beings. Cruel or ineffective gods um, are going to be challenged, as they are in these plays. The revolt will be perceived as, as just. Even Hermes seems to grant this principle. At one point, when he's starving because the sacrifices have been shifted over to the god wealth, and Hermes is, is dying for a meal. <laughs> this is the, the joke in Aristophanes, of course, that the Greek gods depend for their sustenance on, on the sacrifices offered up by human beings below. He's dying for a meal. I mean, he says, feed me, I'm hungry, I'm a god. And, um, you know, Kremlis' uh, um, slave, Cario, says, hey, you know, you just haven't done anything for us. Where have you been? You know, you, you, you've been a very ineffective god. And Hermes seems to grant that principle and then uh, to start arguing about things that he could do for the human beings in the future. In short, gods have to prove themselves in Aristophanes' plays. Their divinity is not sufficient to... Uh, to require that they be treated in a certain way. Similarly, the goddess Poverty begins by protesting that Kremlis would be doing her an injustice if he restores wealth's lost vision. This goddess Poverty appears on stage very angry because she loses if wealth is promoted. But after speaking as though her divinity itself should assure her good treatment, that gods must be treated as gods regardless of what they do, she accepts the burden of trying to show that um, she, in fact, is better for human beings than wealth is. So the criteria for a good god is the god's service uh, to human beings. She is important not only because she will go on to make a strong case on behalf of poverty, but also for her readiness to make goodness to human beings the central question at issue. Okay. Um, let me race ahead a little bit here. Um, Okay, um, I'll stress this point. I think that all of the plays suggest the gods as needy beings. Zeus may adopt the posture of self-sufficiency, august self-sufficiency, but he and his fellow Olympians are very much dependent on human beings. This is the nourishing vapors from the sacrifices that they depend upon. There's also an occasional reminder that they seem dependent also for the sexual opportunities that come from the, to them uh, from being the sort of gods that they are. Um, in the birds, the idea is to win the battle against the gods by starving the gods into submission, building a wall in the sky. This is where the birds will come in handy because it's hard for human beings to build walls in the sky, but the birds with their aerial capacities, they can go up, build this wall in the sky. That will cut off the flow of the vapors up from human sacrifices to the gods. The gods will be starved into submission, Pesatyrus and the birds will triumph. That's the mechanics of the revolution. But very interestingly, I think, and so the birds is not surprisingly read as a fantasy very frequently. It's just impossible. You can't build a, a wall in the sky. I think that's true. You can't. <laughs> I am persuaded. But it's interesting, I think, that when the success of Pesatyrus is actually reported, what is said is not that there was a high wall in the sky that cut off the vapors. It's rather said that human beings have shifted their sacrifices away from the Olympians. They no longer sacrifice to the Olympian gods because they no longer believe the Olympians are so beneficent to them. Birds are better. That is not a fantastic notion of how a, a god could be hurt. A, a god whose great strength comes from being uh, believed in 
um, is going to be damaged if that god cease, um, is, ceases to be believed in. If the power of the Olympians comes only from men's belief in the Olympians, as perhaps the power of human rights comes only when there's a widespread belief in human rights, then changing the beliefs results in the end of the power of the Olympians. What lives by opinion dies by opinion. As human beings perceive needs generally govern the enterprises they undertake, so they affect in particular what they will believe and do with regard to the gods, I think Aristophanes suggests. So I think one of the things that happens here, there's a shocking play. Human beings rebel against the gods. It's led by these three heroes. Um, but most striking to me is it's even more shocking to suggest the gods deserve it. It's a deserved revolution against the gods, not, um, not an undeserved one. Um, the hideous goddess poverty is the only character that I've discovered or that I've noticed that does try to stand up for the Olympians in any uh, coherent fashion whatsoever. And she has a wonderful speech in which she uh, defends poverty as more beneficent for human beings than wealth happens to be. She accepts the burden of showing or trying to show how an apparent defect of the human condition, poverty, is in fact really a blessing. She might persuade each of us that it is better for others to be poor, but she will induce no one, I think, to give thanks to Zeus for their own poverty. The, play, the plays feature a powerful indictment of the Olympians, but I still think nary uh, a defense. Um, I'd like to suggest that as radical as these revolutions are, and I think the revolution of the birds is the most radical, that they do have limits also. And uh, let me mention these, these limits, and then I'll uh, come to a crashing conclusion. Uh, here's, here's limit number one. Um, no one of these three heroes, and you can keep Socrates in the back of your minds at least, that's a comparison to which I'll return to, or a contrast to which I'll return. Um, no one of these three heroes is a defender of athea atheism in each case. Pesatyrus, Trigaius, and Kremlis, they all promote new um, or elevated deities, deities that were minor before, but that get promoted into positions of greater prominence, um, like the goddess Peace, for example. No one of them defends a godless or mechanistic universe in the background. And this, I think, is important. At a minimum, it, it seems to me to be important in, uh, in tactical ways, uh, because it enables the attacker the, uh, the attackers of the Olympians, it enables them to make new promises on behalf of the gods as they try to win support for the revolution in the gods that they're undertaking. So I think the play suggests that the case against Zeus becomes more attractive and hence more powerful if it is made in the name of new gods. Even a loser like Zeus is hard to dislodge if the alternative is nothing, I'm inclined to suggest. And from a human point of view, Socrates' impersonal god, Vortex. That's my reading of the clouds. That's the alternative. There's Vortex back there. From the human point of view, that is nothing. In contrast to Vortex, the birds, for example, are new and improved deities. They promise to, to do better than Zeus did in regard to helping human beings, to helping, help them find abundant food, longer lives, and a measure of wealth. The god wealth similarly promises to reward the just and make it unnecessary to choose between virtue and prosperity. And the goddess peace promises to enable men to ascend, to tend to their vines and enjoy the fruits of simple lives in the country. Great hopes attend these new forces arrayed against Zeus. Aristophanes' heroes are not anti-theistic, they merely seek new gods who come closer to living up to standards implicit in divinity, by which I mean competence and philanthropy, love of human beings or beneficence. That's limit one. Limit two, um, the birds, you, what, you might think that if you're going to overthrow the Olympian gods that this would have not only theological but also moral consequences. How will this change the morality by which we lead our lives? And in the birds, this is an explicit theme where the birds promise a revolution in morality. They say to human beings, hey, when we're gods, don't worry about this moral dilemma, that you've, these moral dilemmas you've been living with all of your lives in which you want something very much, some pleasure, but some notion of what is shameful or some notion of what is noble stands between you and that pleasure so that you are 
conflicted about whether to go ahead and pursue that pleasure. When we're gods, that will disappear. And whatever is shameful, if you want it, that will become possible. And whatever is pleasant, we'll call that, that will be noble. That will be kalam. <laughs> so this, this uh, moral tension between the pleasant and the noble or the shameful, according to the verbs, they're going to solve that particular um, problem. They even mention that if you want to beat your father, you find that pleasant, not a difficulty. Go right ahead. It's a, it's a great moral liberation. And you'll recall, of course, from the clouds that this was precisely the conclusion that Pheidippides came to, that this would be absolutely acceptable uh, to beat your father, or at least it's, it's defensible. So this too reminds of the clouds. But in the birds, Pesatyrus uh, is, is on hand, the leader of the revolution, and he overthrows Zeus, it is true, but he also forbids this, can I call it a moral revolution in the sense of this undoing of morality, promised by the birds, he forbids that from taking root. He comes back and excludes a father beater from settling down with him, says, you can't stay here, we're not going to have that, sends him off to do battle in Thrace. He makes public defenses of justice and moderation. Um, and he affects, you could say, a kind of Thermidoran counter-revolution to put a break on the bold moral claims, or amoral claims, immoral claims that the birds have made. So you don't see a complete uh, liberation in this revolution by Pesatari. It's a very radical revolution, but it doesn't do away with morality. It reinstitutes it. A third limit on the revolutions against the gods concerns the likely scope of their effects. As the very success of the revolution suggests, the power of the gods is limited. If gods are omnipotent and omniscient, they're not overthrown. Although overthrowing the gods brings charges that are certainly important and worth fighting for, and changes that are important and worth fighting for, these changes prove as limited as the gods who are deposed. Well, this is, uh, in, in short, I'm saying, in effect, that Pesatyrus' revolution against the gods, you could say, is a, revol a revolution against whom human beings believe to be gods. That can change a lot but it doesn't change everything. When you overthrow Zeus by overthrowing what is believed about Zeus, you don't abolish the need for law or for chance. You don't do away with nature, for example. Uh, you just change the opinions about the gods. Now, the opinions are very, very important. As you know, in the case of Nicias, for example, in the Sicilian expedition, his opinions about the gods were of decisive importance for the outcome of that expedition. But you, you still can't change nature or chance, I think, by changing the views of the gods. And the piece, um, I think, makes a similar sort of suggestion. I referred especially to the, the birds in that case. Okay. Um, to put this point in more general terms, uh, I would say what is meant by the gods is equivocal. On the one hand, the intermediate causes of what is most important in our lives, taken together, may be taken together and traced back to the gods and be responsible, for example, for our poverty, apparent good and bad luck, perhaps even the demands and dilemmas we face. Gloucester's view is similar when he says that we are to the gods as flies are to wanton boys. The gods are fundamental causes of everything. At the other extreme, which I take to be closer to Aristophanes' own view, one might try to sort out the various different causes that underlie these and other aspects of our lives without tracing them all back to the gods. We trace some to chance, some to nature, still others to law, for example. Still others we may trace to the opinions that people have about the gods. But again, uh, changing opinions doesn't change uh, fundamental things such as laws and nature. In this second view, the discovery of these other causes limits the importance of the gods, perhaps by eliminating them. This weakening makes the conquest possible, but also limits the consequences of the conquest of the gods. In the birds, the gods are responsible, responsible only for those things for which the opinions of men about the gods are responsible. You can throw out pious opinions of gods with a pitchfork. Even if they do not come back, and Aristophanes' plays suggest that they do, their absence will not change the needs of political life for such natural characteristics of men as ambition, pleasure-seeking, and mortality. It appears possible, based on Aristophanes' plays, to overthrow the Olympian gods 
and it also appears they deserve it. But the scope and consequences of such an exciting triumph are more limited than might be thought. Quick conclusion with regard going back to the clouds, and, and then I'm done. Uh, I began with a question of why Aristophanes punishes Socrates on stage, but celebrates Pesatyrus, Trigaius, and Kremlis. On the face of it, at least, Pesatyrus seems the most radical of these characters, more radical than Socrates, for he destroys the Olympian gods and makes himself the highest of the divinities. Nevertheless, Aristophanes' harsher treatment of Socrates might be explained by way of the following points. One, Socrates' science or pseudoscience is not amoral or nihilistic, but it does pose a direct threat to the authority of established laws and fathers, as Strepsiades finally learns. The teacher becomes the central or even the exclusive focus of his student's devotion, and this is a problem for both families and cities. Pesatyrus, by contrast, is very concerned to reestablish a moral code apt for political life. This is most evident in his expulsion of Meton the astronomer, his redirection of the father beater, and his attempt to persuade the sycophant to find a decent way to make a living. Two, Socrates' science or pseudoscience is atheistic, whereas Kremlis and Trigaius are correct to understand themselves as pious, even though they do want to shift the pantheon to favor gods who have not yet received sufficient attention. And whatever Pesatyrus' ultimate view of the gods may be, he is consistent in promoting new divinities. His assault on the Olympians destroys the Olympians, but this is no great loss, for they are aptly replaced. The destruction does no harm and some good. It appears to replace a punitive god with more tolerant ones. I am inclined to think Aristophanes holds it to be good for human beings to look for help and support to gentle and philanthropic gods like peace, wealth, and birds. My next point suggests a reason for this. Three, in addition to being anti-political and atheistic, Socrates' science or pseudoscience is also inhuman in its asceticism. It favors living apart from society and from such natural pleasures as decent meals, bathing, sleeping at some distance from bedbugs, love, enjoying the things that money can buy, and laughter. This asceticism may not make Socrates a threat to the city or warrant punishment, but Aristophanes may still wish to suggest that he, Socrates, is on the wrong track as far as promoting human happiness is concerned. Our three heroes, on the other hand, are all open defenders of life's ordinary and well-known pleasures. Four, and finally, in addition to being anti-political, atheistic, and inhumanly ascetic, Aristophanes shows Socratic science or pseudoscience to be clueless about people and their needs, whereas Pesatyrus' success shows how adroit he is in manipulating fools, both avian and divine, to his own advantage, Socrates fails in part because such oblivion as is his is likely to bring failure in a world such as ours. For reasons like these, it makes sense to me that even the radical deicide, Pesatyrus, is celebrated while the radical atheist, Socrates, is punished. This could not be the case if Aristophanes were not as critical of Zeus as Pesatyrus himself. Thank you. It's time for my boiling. <laughs>